Robert Palmer was the guest on the June 9th, 1988 episode of Later with Bob Costas. And he talks about his uh, climb to stardom on the backs of videos with girls dancing in them and, and relates how he really had his doubts when he went to go make the video, thought it was going to be like a ZZ Top kind of thing and uh, what, what would it do for him and it made him a superstar. I mean, yeah, he had Bad Case of Love and You, a cover of Moon Martin's tune, but, uh, you know, he really never broke through before the girls started dancing. Real interesting, the thing that I learned in the interview is like Stuart Copeland, Robert Palmer's father was an, an intelligence officer, and uh, as a result, Palmer grew up in Malta, Malta Gibraltar, and uh, Cyprus. You know, all the hot spots for the British Empire in the 60s and 50s. They also address the use of rock songs in TV commercials and is it good, is it ethical? And uh, the right answer was uttered by Palmer. If it's done right, you know, you do it wrong, you can really soil the people's impression of a great piece of art. So enjoy this interview with Robert Palmer, June 9th, 1988. Thanks for staying up later. We're back from Los Angeles in our New York studios and our first guest back in our old home, Robert Palmer. We just saw the clip from Addicted to Love and obviously you've been around for a long time. You'd had seven or eight albums which had sold moderately well and generally to critical acclaim. But except, unless I'm forgetting one or two, except for your cover of Bad Case of Loving You, hmm. there wasn't really a hit single in the US, anything that went anywhere near no. the top 10. No, and then all of a sudden, kaboom. Uh, you know, people say, well, sort of an overnight success or whatever. And wasn't I sort of disappointed that it takes so long? But it's been, it's been really good because there are a lot of the things that you've got to deal with when you have uh, a big commercial success. I've got nothing to do with music, and they can overwhelm you and kind of become more important or take up more of your time and you lose your concentration. So it was great to have all those years of practice so that now when all the great opportunities are coming up for me, I feel in a position to deal with it. I'm not, I don't feel drowned in it all, you know. How have you been able to deal with it? Because now, in contrast to those other years, I imagine you walk through an airport, you're very recognizable, and the yeah. demands for your time are greater than you might have imagined. Yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> a lot of it is uh, planning ahead. And so I've got three records in the can. Uh, they're not mixed yet, but that's great to know that. Because that's the first thing that, crazily enough, gets affected when you're going to follow through on the success of this, that, and the other. I mean, there are great opportunities, you know. You don't want to turn them down, but then all of a sudden you find yourself high and dry and you haven't got a record. And that's the most important thing. So that's great, having all those records ready. Which means that as stuff comes up, I can follow it through. And as far as the, this sort of the pressure from the public goes, for me, it's just a matter of seeing it in proportion, because I did a project about three years ago with um, a couple of guys from Duran Duran. It was called The Power Station. And during that time, I was out with them, and it was unbelievable, unbelievable. I mean, they'd, they would at times, just for the hell of it, go and walk in the streets, say, we should be able to do this. And they'd get five yards from the hotel, and it was just mayhem. And I don't have that problem. People say, hi, you know, it's all right. You think because of the image you project with the suits and, the, and, the, and without some of the wild trappings of rock and roll, the music is there, but you're not running around on stage like a banshee, that people therefore respond to you differently yes. when they see you off stage? Yes, I don't go out of my way to um, encourage hysteria. And I'm not an extroverted person. And my music isn't um, like a stadium sort of... M uh, music, it's more an intimate thing, so I think that people that are involved in it perceive me differently, and it's not like, ah, you know, yeah. which is great. I mean, I, I couldn't deal with that. 
when when you hooked up with those guys, uh, the Taylors from yeah. Duran Duran, yeah. and, and Power Station became kind of an ad hoc group. You recorded with them, but you didn't go on the road with them, right? Well, um, the situation was that they'd already been in the studio for hobby fun and cut all these jams and sent me one and asked me if I could come up with a, a melody and some li a lyric. <coughs> and I, I liked the rhythm of this piece and said I'd give it a go. I flew in and tried it and it worked out great. Then I did another one and then a, a third one came up. And then some, a reporter found out that we were recording in a studio called The Power Station. And that was that. Um, during this time, I was finishing off my own record, which was called Riptide. And during the publicity that we did for The Power Station thing, we'd be there and we'd say, oh, we, we couldn't go on the road, we've only got eight songs. What are we going to do, play them three times, you know? Um, and that was the whole idea so I'm in the studio now mixing finishing off my album and the phone rings and it's uh, hey we're going on the road and it was like uh, what who's we you know and just, so generally they just picked up on my lack of enthusiasm for the idea and uh, didn't ask again it was part of the lack of, en of enthusiasm not just the uh, the scarcity of songs but also the fact that if you went on the road with them you'd be involved in a part of rock and roll that I take it from reading about you, you're not really that fond not, of. Not particularly, because you can always avoid that like if you plan to. to. Uh, I just thought it was sort of ill-advised to go out behind eight songs, and at that point, one was doing fairly well, some like it hot. And yet, they were approaching it as if they were going out like Duran Duran, mm -hmm. which they weren't. And I felt it was out of proportion if they'd have been looking at doing 2,000 seat theaters, or even showcase things, it would have given the thing more credibility. Uh, it just looked out of proportion to me. So Had, hadn't you also covered that old T-Rex uh, hit, oh, Bang a Gong? Gong? Yeah, yeah, that was the most ridiculous lyric I've ever been faced with. <laughs> the, um, Got the teeth of the Hydra. And... Uh, yeah, hubcap, diamond star, halo. I mean, I don't know what he was on when he wrote that. It very, but, and I was confronted with this lyric, and I thought I knew it vaguely. It was never yeah. my cup of tea. Good tune, though. Yeah, a good groove. Andy mm -hmm. Taylor's guitar, and it was good. But uh, I just thought, well, it's going to be funny just camp it up, you know, and as soon as I got that idea, I, I think I did it in one take and everybody was hollering with laughter and it was fun, you know. The success of that record was the fact that it was so throwaway. I mean, up until three quarters of the way through the project, it really hadn't got a name or it was for, and it was for no particular purpose other than I think the other half of the group were getting married or something like that and they wanted to just jam in the mm -hmm. studio with their heroes who were the uh, bass and drums from a a group called Chic. So it was it was just for fun, and I think that's what came across. So when you dropped out of Power Station, Michael DeBars came in and, and he replaced you, and you're working on Riptide, and that's what gives rise to Addicted to Love. Mm -hmm. So the obvious question, uh, people out there would be ready to strangle me if I didn't ask it, whose idea was it to throw the models in there and, and give the video the distinctive oh, look? Yeah, um, his name's Terence Donovan, uh, a huge, physically huge, um, black belt judo expert who is a contemporary of David Bailey, uh, a, a very successful fashion photographer in, from the 60s. Um, and I spoke to him on the phone about the thing and said that, uh, uh, this is, we're talking the Addicted to Love video, um, that I felt it should be p a performance, but I didn't see it as a bunch of guys doing it, because it looked a bit too butch. Uh, uh, come across like ZZ Top, and uh, I don't think it would have the humor. And you know, so, whenever I think of ZZ Top, I think of you in the next breath. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I like their tunes a lot. Legs. Um, They're always in a gas station, it that's seems. That's right, yeah. And, and then the car pulls up, yeah. and, and a half dozen gorgeous girls come out. Yeah. They've got a good groove. So he suggested girls, and I, I said, I can't see it. He said, well, they'll be like mannequins, like window dummies. I said, well, I can't see. He said, trust me. So I get there, and it's all set up. He's done, he's set everything up. He's, he's like, um, he knows all the, the right dresses, the right hairdo, the right makeup people. It's his thing, you know. He works for Vogue, Harper's, Queen. Uh, he said, look through the viewfinder. 
And it, that's what it looked like, uh, um, a spread in a magazine, Vogue, you know. I said, that looks great. W w what would you do? He says, oh, you stand on that uh, square there and mime. Took 20 minutes. See ya. Caused a big riot, you know. And, uh, and then the next song that came out was again ideal for the for the setup because it was another very tongue-in-cheek song. Simply Irresistible? No, uh, it was called I Didn't Mean to Turn oh, yeah, You On. From, from the same album. Yeah. yeah. And um, that was a role reversal lyric. The, the song was a, originally sung by a girl and I did it for a joke. So again, it had this campiness to it. And then of course it got carried through like the deluxe version was a Simply Irresistible one. Back now with Robert Palmer. Were any of the women in the videos for Simply Irresistible and, uh, and Addicted to Love and Didn't Mean to Turn You On, were any of them uh, musicians in any way, or all just models who... They were just a busload. Um, they looked like one, too, when they showed up, but as they came out of the dressing room one at a time, they'd been transformed into that, or whatever it was. Did the models themselves seem to have a good time, or was it just oh, another job they, for them? Uh, they bumped into me. At in various locations since, and I don't recognize them because I always saw them like. So it's like, oh, uh, excuse me, uh, oh, are you? Well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I didn't recognize you. That's okay. I just wanted to thank you for the amount of work that I've got from that thing. You know, they've all got like tons of work from it. They, they seem put it in be, their resume, you know. Yeah, they seem to be very well coached as to what the attitude and the body language. Oh yeah, well be. that was him again. You know, he had them rehearsed and everything before I got there. Terrence I don't Donald. know what he. I don't know what he told them. <laughs> How about the subsequent reaction where people would show up at your concerts, women would show up yeah, dressed? Yeah, sort of embarrassing in that um, it was a presentation that was very humorous as far as I was concerned. Um, and the, the whole juxtaposition of this like intense rock music with these like uh, mannequins. and So when people thought that it was um, uh, uh, a serious attempt to put something, you know, like a, I don't know what people think of it really. It, it, I find it very confusing. But uh, when girls would go out of their way to emulate that look, uh, it was very embarrassing, you know. You couldn't ignore it. You had to say something, but it's very difficult. <laughs> How about the opposite? Instead of admiration, some of the criticism from feminists who said, well, you're presenting these women as simply that, as vacant mannequins and their objects for, <coughs> for male titillation. Yeah. Well, um, I've only read about that. I've never come across anybody that's actually been offended by it. And it seems to be a sort of fashionable ism anyway, sexism, you know, um, whatever's going on at the moment. The, so consequently, I think it's a bit out of proportion uh, to pick out that one. I mean, if you sit and watch those shows that run the videos, MTV, I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of the least offensive, you know. When you think about yourself, uh, your records, your videos, in the midst of what's on MTV, do you find it incongruous sometimes? I mean, people sitting, sitting at home watching you sitting here say, this is anything but a rock star by demeanor, by appearance, the tailored suits. And well to a certain extent, but then it's all, by the time it's been made into a video, it's all artifice anyway. Everybody gets dressed up and they bring on the lights to do it. So it's all, it, uh, the look of it has always been in Congress to me. I never saw television or movies till I was 12 years old. I was living in uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, my father was in the Navy. And yet I heard lots and lots of music, but I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know what in instruments looked like even. So. I always found it odd when people went out of their way to, uh, well, often look ridiculous, to draw attention to themselves. So, um, but I, th I think, on the other hand, to answer your question, it is a bit incongruous since uh, my, when my children see me pop up in the midst of these, they yeah. go, Daddy, what are you doing on there? <laughs> you know? uh, but on the other hand, to finish my thought, if you take the visual away, there and listen to say Guns N' Roses. I don't think that I don't think they're a kicking rock band personally, but they look it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it depends. I, I read a quote from you once, and sometimes these quotes are not fully accurate, so you can back it up or refute it. Where you said you like rock music, but you don't like rock and roll. 
Well, it's because um, uh, what I was talking about was the excesses, the what the the behaviour that rock and roll is famous for. You know, the trashing hotels and you know, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. I d I, and I, I don't get it manifested really by talking about it. But um, I was exposed to it when I joined my first group when I was 16. I used to open up for groups like The Who and Jimi Hendrix. And I just couldn't believe the, the behavior. I, it was like, yikes, do I have to be around this in order to get to sing, you know? <laughs> Briefly, you mentioned your father earlier. He had a very interesting job that I, I take it had some effect on you and your view of the world. Yeah, he was um, attached to the Navy, and uh, his, uh, his job was, uh, how can we put it, I don't know if it's still safe. He, um, he, he listened to the movement of foreign shipping, for instance. He was an intelligence officer? Yes, an intelligence officer, th thank you. Um, of course, he couldn't tell us what he did, specifically. Uh, and it, it required that every three years we went to a different base where they were Cyprus, North Africa, Malta, Gibraltar. I suppose because there was a lot going do on down there at the time, you know. And uh, it would, it did give him a world view. Uh, a lot of his, um, a lot of people in his job committed suicide. So it gave him a great sense of humor to protect himself from, I suppose, a lot of foreknowledge that he would have before the mm -hmm. public had it, you know. At times he'd get awfully upset and nobody knew why and he'd say, I can't talk about it. <laughs> so, uh... Did that spur your imagination? Just wondering about what it no, might be he was dealing with and the no, mystery of it? No, beca because the other aspect was that he worked shifts, like three days on, three days off, some nights. So a lot of the time, we were, since it was on a tiny island, it would be off to the beach. So it was pretty much a fun time and it was, uh, I wasn't interested, you know, it never came up. How do you react to the criticism, and you haven't been singled out for it, others who've done the same thing have heard it, where rock music is used as a commercial vehicle, simply irresistible for Pepsi, mm -hmm. uh, even one of your old heroes, Sinatra is on a Michelob uh, Oh, yeah, I haven't seen yeah, that. Yeah, and, and Eric Clapton, uh, yeah. I think Graham Nash's uh, our house is being used by Sears, and mm -hmm. some people say that that, uh, that bastardizes the music and the artistic merit. Well, in some cases, it does, and it's up to whoever's doing it to make sure that they have control and understand what they're getting themselves into. For instance, when I was approached to do the advert for the soda, um, my first reaction was, uh, Wait, I, I'm not going to change the song. No, no, you don't have to change the song. Uh, well. I'm not going to change the look, the video. No, you don't have to change the video. Well, uh, I've got to use the same director, because otherwise I won't achieve it. Yes, you can use the same director. Well, what do you want me to do then? Well, just do the same thing, and we just put pictures of the product in there. Oh, I see. And, of course, we were talking about the videos earlier on. A lot of countries don't run videos. So, where am I going to... And, but they sell Pepsi, so you mm -hmm. get a free exposure. Well, on the other hand, my, the, the reason that my reaction was like that was that I'd heard Michael Jackson singing, and Pepsi's good, it's good, and I was, you know, so that's up to him if he wants to do that. Uh, in a general sense, it, it's, uh, it, de it depends on, I mean, <laughs> what the song is and what the product is. I mean, it could get really funny, you know. <laughs> sing Nature Boy to advertise toilet cleaner. You know, it, w <laughs> it would be inappropriate. But as long as the things don't rub too hard, it's all right. Heavy Nova's been out for a while. When's the next one due? September. Um, I'm producing at the moment uh, the first of two parts of The Best of Robert Palmer. And I guess uh, that'll be the next thing that'll come up before I delve into the, back into the studio and start finishing all the other records I've got waiting there. We've got to wrap it up. Pleasure spending time with you. All right, thank As you. As you yourself said during the commercial, it's time now to reach for the hot milk. Okay. We'll see you later. Good night. Join us tomorrow night for Mighty Mouth, Morton Downey Jr.